caged world in which lawyers determine what they can write, play, and record. If you understand this, you can see why musical forms have taken such a huge tumble in the last 100 years, while creativity has taken place only in sectors that eschew copyright, such as jazz and independent rock. As for recording, the whole effort to prevent file sharing has been a disaster for artists. Again, this resulted from special interest legislation. The tethers are so tight now that many bands are reduced to refusing any recording contracts at all, merely so that they can distribute their own music the way they want to. This has been proven again and again to be compatible with huge sales. The best-selling CDs of last year were also the ones available for free download. Whenever this subject comes up, people unthinkingly toss around crazy bromides. You mean you want to allow anyone to just steal anyone's work? Why would anyone bother to write a book, write a song? These kinds of questions reflect what happens to our thinking in a time of statism. We can't imagine how freedom would work. We do not, for example, ask similar questions about other services. If you allow the private growing of vegetables, why would anyone bother to start commercial farms or open grocery stores? If you allow people to cook at home, why would anyone open a restaurant? If you allow people to just share recipes, why would anyone become a master chef? You would just allow anyone to steal the idea of a tomato sauce or a fancy dish that took years in culinary school to create? These questions only sound stupid to us because we don't have existing laws covering these topics. Somehow, everything works out. Because we have copyright, we can't even imagine how we could get along without it. And yet, we see many examples around us. Public domain works are hugely popular, and firms profit from selling them, and they are more prevalent than copyrighted works. What I find striking is that copyright operates today by state-authorized theft of creativity by large firms. Writers and composers and bands permit themselves to be looted of their own right to distribute their own work. Composers work years on a piece and then give up the results to some business corporation in exchange for their right to publicly hum the tune they wrote. It is astounding and wholly non-viable. Fortunately, the free market is finding a workaround to evil copyright laws in the form of Creative Commons and other institutions. In this way, at least there is a path to freedom for us, whereas the same can't be said of patent laws. One last note. Do not write me with some smarty-pants remark about how, if we are serious, the Mises Institute should allow anyone to publish our books. All our new works, insofar as it is possible, will be published with a Creative Commons license as a matter of signed contract with authors. As for this book, please, quote, steal it. That goes for anything I write. If you can sell it and make a buck, good for you. If you become a millionaire, shame on me for not thinking of it first. Back to basics on property and competition. Zeroing in on a topic like intellectual property offers a chance to clarify fundamental notions in economics generally. You think you understand something like property rights or the nature of competition, you have studied the ideas for years, and then a challenge comes along that blows everything up. It's an opportunity, time to think, and think again. Is there really property in ideas? And if so, what rules should govern it? Is it really necessary that such property be protected in order that competition be kept fair and just and efficient? The authors of Against Intellectual Monopoly state at the outset of Chapter 6 that property is a great and indispensable thing. It allows people to own, develop, be creative, profit, and build a prosperous society. Societies without private property stagnate and die. Property rights are necessary too when there is a limit on the number of things in question. But owning a thing doesn't prevent others from owning other things too. For example, cars. 
they must be allocated through property rights because there is a potential for conflict if they are collectively owned. But my owning a car doesn't prevent you from owning a car. There is no coercion involved in the institution of ownership. The authors make a very important point with regard to ideas. If you have an idea, it is yours. You can do with it what you want. If you share it, sing, speak, broadcast, let others see the products of your ideas, others then have copies of it. They are entitled to do with their copies of the idea precisely what you can do with your idea. They can use it how they want, provided they don't prevent others from doing with it what they want. This is a simple application of the non-aggression principle that governs a free society. Whether it is fashion, language, know-how, or whatever, people are free to copy. Ideas, then, are what Mises called free goods. Copies are potentially limitless. They do not need to be economized. Intellectual property is the completely wrong-headed idea that, in the words of the authors, someone has the right to monopolize an idea by telling other people how they may, or more often may not, use the copies they own. This strikes at the heart of progress, because it means not improving what exists, but rather prohibiting others from using and improving it. In the same way that property is good, competition is also good. It inspires people to strive for excellence and to measure their progress against what others are doing. It allows people to try and fail or try and succeed. It permits people to learn from each other, looking at what others do that is successful and emulating them. This is how society leaps forward from stage to stage, how we went from horses to engines, how plumbing came indoors, how industry took over from agriculture, how the digital came to be. Competition is predicated on the ability to learn and copy. If you think about it, this is the essence of daily life. We watch how people do things and learn from them. We get on the subway and hold the stabilizing strap a certain way. We follow fashion sense. We watch the Food Network. We listen to our professors and talk to other students. We read and absorb the ideas of articles on the internet. The newly taught person becomes a competitor. The student becomes a professor, for example. The protégé is always a threat to the monopoly previously held by the mentor. What can you copy? Anything and everything. This is not taking anything from anyone. The owner of the original idea still has his. Other people now have their copies and are free to improve them. Commerce is part of this stream of life. And in fact, learning through imitation and improvement is even more crucially important if we want to sustain a rising population with ever better health and well-being at their disposal. Let's say I write a book and publish 1,000 copies. They are all mine. When I sell one, I now have 999 remaining. And the new owner of the one book in a free society is free to do with his copy what he wants, use it as a placemat, throw it away, deface it, photocopy, and even republish it. You can even republish it under your own name, though that would amount to the socially repudiated vice of plagiarism. Vice, not crime. The new copies, which always involve some cost, compete with old copies. What are the advantages of living under intellectual freedom, as described above? The authors list three main ones. One. The number of copies is more plentiful, and their price is thereby lower, which helps consumers. I like this point because it underscores that IP is really what the old classical liberals denounced as a producer's policy, like protectionism or industrial subsidies. It beefs up the bottom line of specific firms at the consumer's expense. 2. The initial innovator still earns money, as in the perfume or fashion or recipe industry. 3. The market functions whether there is one innovator or many, and socially beneficial simultaneous innovation is possible. The authors give the example of Mozart and Beethoven, 
who published without IP but did very well by being the first to market. This is the source of profits. It's the same today with products such as the iPhone. It was the first time market and Apple made a killing, enough of one to have inspired and ratified the initial innovation. Now they are attempting to prolong their period of monopoly profits by considering patent suits against imitators. Society is certainly not better off under these conditions. As the authors say, the goal of economic efficiency is not that of making monopolists as rich as possible. In fact, it is almost the opposite. The goal of economic efficiency is that of making us all as well off as possible. It's interesting how many people immediately object that no one would create things under free market competition. Look around! A tiny fraction of what we use and experience every day is subjected to intellectual monopoly. And look at your own life. Do you trim the bushes in front of your house only because you then have copyright to your new design? Do you take a casserole to a potluck lunch only on the belief that no one is permitted to copy your dish? Do you wear a navy jacket with a yellow tie only on the condition that no co-worker is permitted to do the same? There was no IP at all for many centuries during the greatest period of modern economic growth from the 15th century onward. Others generate all kinds of arguments to show that competition doesn't work. For example, we are told that very high costs are associated with some investments, and so monopoly is required in order for investors to make a profit and thereby have incentive to invest and innovate. The authors cite the case of shoes and gasoline. Building a shoe factory or an oil refinery plant is a very expensive undertaking, and competition is everywhere. But somehow no one suggests that these must thereby be produced under monopoly conditions. I suggest that the reason is that we experience competitive conditions in these industries. It is so difficult for people to even imagine freedom where it doesn't exist. I recall a story told to me by an economist who was serving as an advisor to a former Soviet satellite state. He advised free labor markets and privatization. Officials objected that this wouldn't work because people might build plants where there are no workers. He said that people would just move to the places where capital is most profitable for labor. The officials objected that they couldn't possibly allow the freedom for people to live wherever they wanted. This would amount to an intolerable kind of anarchy. They just couldn't imagine how such a system could work. There are advantages to being the first mover in markets, and here is the main source of the innovator's profits. But there is no reason to freeze the market process right there. In many ways, IP represents the same fallacy that antitrust does. It takes a snapshot of the economy in one stage and evaluates it and manufactures a policy response. Antitrust tries to break up what only temporarily appear to be monopolies. IP attempts to create and sustain monopolies over time. Competition, by contrast, lets the market work as an undirected and uncontrolled and rivalrous process of discovery, emulation, and creativity. Will some firms suffer under competition? Of course. Competition is not a gala dinner, write Baudrin and Levine, and getting rid of inefficient firms while allowing efficient ones to blossom is exactly what competition is supposed to accomplish. The chapter ends with a hymn to imitation as a social force. These few paragraphs are so important, and what they imply is something that I believe has been overlooked by classical liberals. It is a foundation of social order, and that gives us three talked about in this chapter. Property, which gives rise to exchange, competition, a species of cooperation, and imitation, learning through emulation. Fallacy run amok. Fed up with the patent craze, The Economist magazine wrote the following in a main editorial. The granting of patents inflames cupidity, excites fraud, stimulates men to run after schemes that may enable them to levy a tax on the public, begets disputes and quarrels betwixt inventors, provokes endless lawsuits. The principle of the law from which such consequences flow cannot be just. It's not in a current issue. That was published in 1851. 
but every word of it remains true today. It was once conventional wisdom among economists that state-granted monopolies were as bad as mercantilism. But in the meantime, some time after the middle of the 20th century, the conventional wisdom became confused. The source of the problem was a mechanistic view of the market embodied in the idea of general equilibrium theory. It is a theoretical picture of what the macro economy looks like when all the dust is settled. Demand and supply perfectly match. The prices of all things have been competitively bid down to their cost, so there are no profits. All prices are a given, and all markets are cleared. There is perfect information, perfect rationality, no uncertainty, and no transaction costs or any other costs. Indeed, there is no activity at all. All the world is made of perfectly satisfied robots. It's a mathematical notion only, but once it is embedded in your head as a picture of a perfect economic world, it is a small step toward using it as a benchmark for the whole of economic theorizing. It turns out that the case for patents and copyright is bound up with this theoretical notion, and Beltran and Levine's seventh chapter of Against Intellectual Monopoly has the authors grappling with this idea's problems. Joseph Schumpeter was an advocate of patents precisely because he couldn't shake the general equilibrium idea out of his head. He sought to account for how change happens under general equilibrium and settled on a theory of entrepreneurship that imagines an innovation that shakes up the dust before it settles into a new pattern. Rothbard called this breaking out of the Walrassian box. With his benchmark, imitation would be as costless as any other activity, so it seemed necessary for the innovator to have an exclusive right to produce for a period during which profits could be earned. Otherwise, the creative destruction necessary for social and economic advance can't take place. Well, the core problem here is that general equilibrium has nothing at all to do with the way an economy works, as the Austrians have pointed out for half a century. There are costs to every action, pervasive uncertainties in all aspects of life. Entrepreneurship is inherent in all action, and the clearing of markets takes place over time, and through a process of ceaseless trial, error, and change. It is a fascinating idea that the core reason why economists have only recently begun to look critically at the problem of IP is due to the triumph of the general equilibrium construct and the associated mathematization of the profession that excludes the possibility of modeling central features of real-world markets. We can chalk this up as yet another cost associated with the refusal of the profession to fully absorb the ideas of Menger, Mises, and Hayek. This is the core theoretical problem with those who believe that innovation cannot occur in the absence of IP law. They assume a world in which all the hard stuff of life is a snap. In fact, imitation is costly and takes time. It requires effort. Even if a process or product is perfectly imitated, getting the product to market is a far more serious hurdle than simply copying something. It took a hundred years for the process of silk making to be imitated successfully. Even to this day, most of the world cannot figure out how to make a decent cup of espresso. And even the possibility of quick and easy imitation doesn't strip away the profits associated with being first to market. I'm pretty good at making ice cream, and I could probably replicate the Moose Tracks recipe over the course of a weekend of experimenting. But it isn't the Moose Tracks, trademarks, copyrights, and patents that prevent me from doing it. It's because I have better things to do, and bringing anything to market has huge opportunity costs. Even if competitive but nearly identical products make it to market, that doesn't necessarily mean that the first mover cannot maintain a profit stream. The authors cite the case of Travel Pro, the suitcase with the handle that has thousands of imitators. Yet even now, Travel Pro does a booming business through ceaseless innovation, marketing, brand recognition, and competitive pricing. 
If you take the arguments of the IP advocates seriously, you would never be able to figure out how there could be a thriving market for pizzas. There are high startup costs, buildings, employees, ovens, drivers, technique, and yet there is a very low marginal profit associated with selling each one, a product that can be imitated by anyone. Surely there must be a recipe copywriter, a a patent on the pizza, a monopoly of providers in order to make sure that someone is willing to undertake this task. And yet, look around. There are a dozen places you can call to bring a pizza to your desk in 20 minutes. Another argument concerns the idea of overgrazing. If you put ideas into the commons, they will be overused and degraded the same as regular property. This is true with real property. Public schools, public roads, public lands, and the like are all overutilized and fall into disrepair for lack of any economizing mechanisms that allows rational allocation. What about intellectual property? The Walt Disney Company says that its IP in Mickey Mouse is designed to prevent overgrazing, that if he went into the public domain he would be drawn as cat food or placed in unseemly settings its currency would be debased. Of course, you can make the same argument about anything, such as pizzas or all food, but there is no question that while an imaginary pizza and food monopolist would be worse off under competitive conditions, society is most certainly better off because anyone can make a pizza or make food. The authors make a further telling point in passing. When some good or service today is labeled as Mickey Mouse... It is certainly not intended as a compliment. So despite the monopoly, the cartoon figure has certainly been degraded. Many pro-IP arguments boil down to beliefs that something is either going to be undersupplied or oversupplied on a competitive market. In other words, this is the same argument used for all forms of claims about market failures. I can recall that there was great controversy when the first books about medical information and pharmaceutical drugs came on the market. Shouldn't doctors and pharmacies hold the monopoly? Somehow, however, everything worked out. We buy books, look up medical information online, and still go to see the doctor. All providers are annoyed by competition. College professors are not entirely thrilled about idiots and dummies guides but sometimes a colleague breaks ranks and writes one. This is just part of the rough and tumble of life in the absence of a general equilibrium. The Hoax of Invention History All popular business histories are replete with lies. Or, to be more charitable, they are filled with untruths based on a stupid version of cause and effect. Inventions happen because people take out a patent on them. This assumption is hardly ever questioned in the mainline literature. Writers look through patent records and assume that they are a record of technological advance. The truth is far messier. The patent records are a snapshot of those who filed a patent, and nothing more. It is because of patent-based historiography that people believe that the Wright brothers invented the airplane, when in fact they made only a tiny contribution of combining wing warping with a rudder. It was Sir George Cayley in Britain and Otto Lilienthal of Germany who did the bulk of the work of inventing the airplane. But it was the Wright brothers who applied for the patent and quickly used it against Glenn Curtis, who improved wing warping with movable control surfaces. So it was with the radio, which is conventionally attributed to Giulielmo Marconi, the Nobel Prize winner in 1909. What about the contribution of Oliver Lodge in the UK, or the forgotten genius Nikola Tesla, or the Russian Alexander Popov, or the British naval engineer Henry B. Jackson? All Marconi did was ground the antennae, and also managed to win the patent wars thanks to the deep pockets of fellow aristocrat and partner Andrew Carnegie. Fifty years after the patent was granted, the Supreme Court conceded that it was unjustly given, but by then the other claimants were dead. Marconi was consistent, at least. He was a big supporter of fascism in Italy. Then there is the famous myth about Alexander Bell, 
the displaced knowledge of the real inventor of the telephone, Antonio Maiucci. But Maiucci couldn't afford the fee to file the patent. This oversight was fixed in a 2002 declaration by the U.S. Congress, but just a bit too late. There is an unlimited number of such cases that lead to fundamental questioning of the relationship between patents and innovation. It turns out that there are very few great leaps forward in history that are the result of a single Prometheus-style figure. Most advances are the cooperative work of many factors alive in society, with individuals improving things a bit at a time until all those improvements come together in a marketable form. The patent has essentially nothing to do with it. And Baudrin and Levine are hardly the first to point this out. You might be surprised to know that many academic economists have done empirical studies on the relationship between patents and economic advance. Of all those studies they reviewed, 23 in total, they found none that could establish a strong relationship and many that found negative relationships between patents and development. That is, that patents actually impede progress. What they found further is that the main contribution of patents is to increase the production of patents. But that is not the same as increasing invention, for the main use of the patent is to put a stop to any similar innovation that builds upon and improves the patented thing. The patent holder rides high for a time, but history is actually frozen in place. The process of imitation and sharing that led to the innovation becomes formalized, centralized, fixed, and stagnant. They examine the case of databases, which are patented in Europe, but not in the United States. The United States wins the competition easily. The American dominance of database production runs 2.5 to 1 compared with Europe. To me, this helps explain what many have noticed, namely, that Europe is seriously behind in its digitalization and organization of information, with most Europeans possessing oddly antiquated intellectual capital concerning even the most basic databasing skills. Now we know. It's not their fault. It's the fault of their IP regimes. Thus does Chapter 8 of Against Intellectual Monopoly discuss all the existing literature that makes the case, on purpose or inadvertently, against patents. It is packed with empirical detail, but in particular, I'm intrigued at their review of the history of musical composition in England and Europe during the 18th and 19th centuries. They find that the countries with no copyright legislation, German territories in particular, had more composers per capita than countries like England. And in England in particular, the 1750 copyright law, extended to music in 1777, had the effect of bringing the entire composition industry to a grinding halt. And later, when copyright was imposed on Italy and France, it led to a diminution of composer effort. This demonstration is intriguing beyond what most music historians can possibly imagine. It solves a long-running mystery concerning how it came to be that the most musically educated population in the world, one with a massive history of compositional genius, would suddenly fail to participate in the progress that defined the age of Mozart and Beethoven. These historians just haven't known where to look for clues. This chapter makes me sad for all the great innovators whose names are not in the history books, and even sadder for all of us who have been denied great innovations because some fool managed to make it to the patent office first, only to use that privilege to kill his competition the next day. Far from encouraging innovation, patent and copyright have managed to kill off so many wonderful works of art and technologies that it boggles the mind. In order to understand this, you have to look beyond the patent records. You have to train yourself to look at the unseen costs of government regulation. Do patents save our lives? 
How essential are drug patents as a piece of the machinery of the modern pharmaceutical industry? Incredibly so. Repealing them with no other changes would likely lead to a dismantling of a massive and lucrative industry that saves lives every day. To elaborate, without patents, compensation for the hundreds of millions of dollars necessary for jumping through FDA hoops would not be forthcoming. Without patents, the huge manufacturers who face mandatory disclosure requirements would have their formulas taken by others and knockoffs would immediately drive the price to marginal cost. The vast costs of redundant testing and retesting could not be absorbed by future revenue streams, and these streams are themselves uncertain due to the arbitrariness of the FDA's process. And thanks to wicked antitrust laws, companies face a legal minefield in combining efforts, cooperating on research, maintaining prices, and sharing markets. But notice that all the reasons why patents in pharmaceuticals seem necessary are themselves due to some other form of government intervention. Drug regulation, antitrust, government funding, and government mandates of all sorts. Regulation has begotten regulation, with each step seemingly dependent on every other regulation. The result is a massive rat's nest of laws that is buried deep within a much larger hairball of the medical industry itself, which has been dominated by increasingly tight state controls for nearly a century. Then there is a further problem of liability confusion and court precedent that is woven through the system like a tapeworm in a deeply diseased body. How can anyone begin to discuss only one aspect of the marketplace without thoroughly discussing all the other aspects? How can the authors of Against Intellectual Monopoly possibly sort through this thicket to make a case for repealing patents on pharmaceuticals? Because of the above complications, I dreaded this chapter most. I was wrong to do so. What they have produced is a masterpiece of exposition. They have both the big picture and the small picture, with fascinating details in paragraph after paragraph. They take the reader through the logic and evidence at just the right pace and manage the seemingly impossible. The reader is wholly convinced that drug patents are not necessary, and in fact are doing great evil in the world today. It is the hardest case to make, and they knew this going in. Theirs is a virtuoso performance worthy of separate publication. Some people love the farms, and other people hate them. The authors take a middle ground position. They do great good for the world, but they are embedded deep within a regulatory regime that is stultifying the industry, and drug patents play a big role in this. Can we imagine a world without drug patents? No need to dream. In the sweep of history, patents like we have today are essentially a post-war phenomenon, and prior to that, the industry developed faster in countries without patents than those with them. One way to show that is to examine 19th century chemical production. They tell the story of the French patent on coloring dyes, granted to the La Fouchine Company a patent that pretty well destroyed all development in France, while the absence of patent in Germany, Switzerland and Britain led to massive innovation and the beginnings of the modern industry. The United States was very behind here due to its strong patents, and even in the First World War, the United States had to import dyes from Germany in violation of the British blockade. This was how DuPont got its start. In recent decades, there have been pockets of farm patent freedom. Before 1978, it was Italy, where a thriving industry existed for a century, in the absence of patents. The patent accounted for the discovery of 10% of the new compounds between 1961 and 1980. Foreign companies poured into Italy to imitate and develop. But this shut down after 1978, when Italy introduced patents under pressure from foreign multinationals. India then took the position of the free market country, and its industry became a huge player in the generic drug production market, 
until India too was forced into the WTO agreement and shut down its dynamic market. The whole world of pharmaceuticals is now engulfed in an incredible patent thicket. And people praise all the innovation taking place, but rarely ask how much prior innovation really owes to the patent, or how much innovation we might experience, or how low the prices would be in absence of the patent. Baldrin and Levine dare to ask the question about where the innovations of highest social value over the centuries have come from. They looked through medical journals and found several surveys. What were the medical milestones most significant in history? The list. Penicillin, x-rays, tissue culture, anesthetic, chlorpromazine, public sanitation, germ theory, evidence-based medicine, vaccines, the pill, computers, oral rehydration therapy, DNS structure, monoclonal antibody technology, and the discovery of the health risks of smoking. Only two of these were patented, or were due to some previous patent, or brought about with a patent incentive. A separate list of the top ten public health achievements of the 20th century was put together by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It is striking that not a single one involved patents at any level. Several people wrote in to complain that aspirin, helicobacter pylori, and medline were not on the list. None owes anything to patents. Even looking at a list of top pharmaceuticals does not produce a patent-favorable result. Baldrin and Levine find that patents had nothing to do with aspirin, AZT, cyclosporine, digoxin, ether, fluoride, insulin, isonazid, medical marijuana, methadone, morphine, oxytocin, penicillin, phenobarbital, prontosil, quinine, ritalin, methylphenidate, selvrasan, vaccines, or vitamins. Of the remaining products that owe their existence to patents, most were either discovered accidentally, were discovered in university labs, or were simultaneous discoveries that led to expensive battles over who would get the patent. The authors turned to the problems of corruption in farms and to their relationship with doctors, and to the crazy requirements involved in redundant testing for patents and final FDA approval. More than half of newly patented drugs are nothing other than repackaging of existing drugs on the market. It is not uncommon for a drug going out of patent to be repatented as something new, but that requires massive new clinical trials and high costs. The companies then have the incentive to market the patented over the out-of-patent product, and doctors have proven responsive to this tactic. It is not surprising that even some studies sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry have concluded that they would be better off without the patent, given the high costs of otherwise adhering to the mandates, marketing, and all the rest, and especially given that the length of patent is comparatively short, given the time required for FDA approval. Despite all odds, the authors have made a very compelling case that a free market in pharmaceuticals would lead to the development of innovative drugs, save dramatically in all the associated costs of bringing drugs to market today, and save consumers a bundle. Even if you are completely unconvinced by this cursory summary, I urge you to read their entire case. It causes a mind-shifting to take place, consistent with the overall theme of the book. Competition, not monopoly, is the source of innovation and development. Life-saving drugs are too important to be left to government grants of monopoly. The Mercantilism of Our Time Someone handed me a book the other day, a cult classic among music geeks, and urged me to read it. And when I had finished, sign my name in the front cover. That way I could be added to the already long list of readers in the front cover, each of whom had added his or her scroll to the book after having read it. How charming. Except for one thing. 
This is in complete violation of the spirit of intellectual property law. All these readers were sharing the same book instead of buying a new copy. Think of the revenue lost to the publisher and the royalties lost to the author. Why, if this gets out of hand, no one will ever write or publish again. These readers are all pirates and thieves, and they should probably be subject to prosecution. So goes the rationale behind intellectual property law. It's what economists call a producer's policy, designed to create maximum revenue for one side of the economic exchange. Consumers be damned. In that sense, it is exactly like trade protection, a short-sighted policy that stymies growth, robs consumers, and subsidizes inefficiency. It's Bastiat's petition of the candlemakers against the sun, all over again. Apply the IP principle consistently, and it's a wonder we tolerate public libraries, where people are encouraged to share the same copy of a book rather than buy a new copy. Isn't this also an institutionalized form of piracy? The defenders of IP would have to admit that it is. They are often driven to crazy extremes in sticking to the claim that copying is a form of theft. I asked one emphatic correspondent about the ethics of the following case. I see a guy in a blue shirt and like it, so I respond by wearing one too. Is this immoral? No, he said, because the color blue occurs in nature. What if a person draws a yellow happy face on the blue shirt? Can I copy that? No, he said, this would be immoral. I must ask his permission and gain his consent. Actually, it's even worse than this case suggests. If even one person had previously worn a blue shirt with a happy face, no one else on the planet would be able to do that without seeking consent. It should be obvious that if everyone were required to seek the permission for the use of every infinitely reproducible thing that belongs to someone else, every word, phrase, look, vocal inflection, chord progression, arrangement of letters, hairstyle, technique, or whatever, or if we were really to suppose that only one person may possess the unique instance of any of these things, civilization would come to a grinding halt. Sadly, this is where our laws are tending. Right now, there are laws being considered that would step up IP enforcement to the point of clear absurdity. Just last week, YouTube removed the background music of countless videos for copyright reasons, even though such videos help popularize the music. Even Home performances of songs written in the 1930s, young kids playing piano and singing, were taken down at the behest of producers. People are talking about extending patents to sports moves, extending copyright to storylines, imposing a central plan on computer design to comply with patents, forcing everyone on the planet to obey US-style IP laws by means of military force. Kids are going to jail, institutions are hiring internal police forces to watch for IP violations, and an entire generation is growing up with a deeply cynical attitude toward the entire business of law. We are at a prohibition-style moment with regard to IP, just as with liquor in the 1920s. The war on the banned things isn't working. Those in power face the choice of stepping it up even further and thereby imposing a militarized state in place of anything resembling freedom, or they can admit that the current configuration of law has no future and bring some rationality to the question. Other societies have indeed crushed innovation with this very impulse. Do you know why we celebrate Columbus Day, instead of Cheng Ho Day? Cheng Ho was a great Chinese explorer who, in the early 15th century, took his fleets to Africa and the Middle East. But he was forced to stop when the elites in the home country began to feel threatened by his discoveries. The Chinese government won the war on exploration and became static and inward. You can win a war on progress, but the gains 
over the long term are few. In addition to relaying the above story, the authors of Against Intellectual Monopoly, in the last chapter of their fantastic book, make a case for the complete dismantling of the law. Intellectual property is a cancer, they write. The goal must be not merely to make the cancer more benign, but ultimately to get rid of it entirely. The authors do not leave it at that. They are intellectuals of the real world. They first make a case against any further expansion of bad laws and lay out some reform proposals, shortening patent and copyright terms, changing burden of proof for originality, eliminating ridiculous redundancy trials for drugs, and the like. The authors even volunteer their time to help craft legislation. But the really hard work here is intellectual, since the pro-IP bias is so entrenched. The authors take the pure abolitionist position as a way of shocking us out of our stupor. Is change possible? Of course. It was thought in the Middle Ages that most all products required monopoly production. The salt producer would enter into an agreement with the ruler. The ruler would promise a monopoly in exchange for a share of the revenue. It was thought that this would guarantee access to a valuable commodity. How can anyone make a buck without a guarantee that his hard work would be compensated? Well, it took time, but eventually people realized that competition and markets actually do provide, as implausible as it may seem. As the centuries moved on, markets became ever freer, and we no longer believed that the king must confer a special status on any producer. They still do it, of course, but mostly for open reasons of political patronage. And yet, in this one area of intellectual property, all the old mercantilist myths survive. People still believe that a state grant of monopoly privilege is necessary for the market to work. The myth has now been crushed with this book. So now the laws can be beaten back, and they are being beaten back in the age of digital media. Realize that for young people today, the initials RIAA and MPAA are the most hated on the planet, the equivalent of the IRS for a past generation. The heck of it is that these are private entities. Think what this means. Capitalists of the world, please pay attention. You have a serious problem when an entire generation is being raised to hate private capitalistic institutions. Now, you and I know that these institutions are doing something illegitimate, namely enforcing intellectual property, which is really nothing but state coercion. Still, this besmirches the reputation of free markets. So too is a generation of socialists being raised to hate U.S. foreign policy on the belief that its export of IP is a form of capitalist imperialism. For these reasons, no one has a stronger interest in abolishing intellectual property than supporters of capitalism. I said at the beginning of this book that it took me fully six years to think through these issues. The book by Baldrin and Levine broke through the reservations I had that remained. In the meantime, I've received hundreds of messages to the effect that other readers have made the jump too. Whatever is holding you back, I beg you to read this account. I personally consider it to be one of the most mind-blowing books I've ever encountered. And so now I join the armies of people who are demanding an end to a system that threatens our way of life in the most fundamental way. For this reason, this book is seminal not only for our times, but for the entire history of liberty. It has clarified a point that has been a source of confusion for many years and put it front and center in the current debate. It might need correcting in places, and I have my own nits to pick over their neoclassical framework and talk of social costs and the like, but these are petty concerns as compared with the overall framework. What they have done is marvelous and extremely important.